All right. Hi, everyone. Um, Hello. My name is Sean Peterson, and I'm Lynn Schofield. And we're two of the people who run Cal Falcons, um, and we're here to answer all of your questions about the soap opera that's that's kind of occurring yeah. around the Campanile right now. Yeah, we're um, waiting on also an additional guest who's a um, raptor rehab who rehabber who knows all about uh, the process that Grinnell is going through right now, and she'll be joining us shortly. But we'll get started for now and just get to um, the beginning with questions that we have. So this one is so we can all get oriented on what's going on, which is what happened to Grinnell and why <laughs> is he in rehab right now? So uh, Grinnell was... Uh, hurt by a fell injured by probably a another falcon definitely a raptor um we have kind of a secondhand report of someone seeing uh three falcons fighting the day that he was hurt um and so it's kind of looking like he got into a fight with two uh two other peregrine falcons oh and i think our guest has arrived all right so um hi <laughs> Let's see. There we go. Hello. Welcome. Hi. So um, happy to be uh, here. This is uh, our guest today is Cheryl, um, who is a longtime volunteer at the Lindsay Wildlife Experience, where they are rehabbing Grinnell. Um, and Cheryl, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Cheryl. Um, I've been a volunteer um, for over 20 years at Lindsay. I was on staff in the Wildlife Hospital for several years. And I've developed a specialty in falcons and certain species of owls over the past 20 years. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, which leads me to kind of a question of my own. Um, you say you have a specialty specifically in falcons. What is different when it comes to working with falcons as opposed to, you know, another species of even raptor like the owls? There are a lot of differences, individual differences in species, and that's one of the things when you're in wildlife rehabilitation, you have to know a little bit about their natural history and the biology and behavior uh, to understand how best to care for them. I mean, clearly falcons are bird-eating birds, some, not all, but peregrines are certainly mainly bird-eating, and that's um, uh, information that you need to know to be able to rehab any different species. What you know, what is their most common food source? What are they willing to eat, not eat? I mean, great horned owls, for example, will eat absolutely anything. <laughs> um, peregrines are a little pickier. All right, cool. Well, we were just starting off with kind of a, a quick uh, summary of what happened. So uh, Grinnell was uh, injured on the 29th um, and was uh, found on, sitting on a garbage can um, and just easily picked up. Um, so he was exhausted and injured, um, taken to Lindsay Wildlife same day um, where they kind of did an initial assessment of, of him and took some x-rays over the weekend. Um, and uh, Cheryl, do you, can, can you give us a rundown of what um, kind of the procedures that went through, he went sure. through? Well, every animal that's brought into Lindsay Wildlife and that's over 5,000 animals each year, um, is given um, a, an initial exam to try to determine uh, what's going on with that animal. Um, the first thing that we ask for when people bring us an animal is that they give us detailed information about the circumstances that they found that animal. A lot of uh, birds, for example, will fly into windows. So even if they say they found the bird on the ground, we'll try to determine, okay, was there a window nearby? Because uh, that'll give us some place to start in the initial exam. And then we always put the animals in somewhere that's quiet and let them sort of chill for a little while because a lot of times they've been through a lot of stress and a lot of drama um, just getting to the wildlife hospital. So we'll do that. Uh, we'll usually give them some uh, subcutaneous fluids. Fluids are a miracle uh, drug, just plain old almost water 
Uh, it's a little more sophisticated than water, but it's it's fluids, and fluids are very helpful when animals are in stress. Uh, and then once they're a little calmer, in some cases with some species, they will never get calm, um, but we'll then proceed to give them a, a full exam and try to figure out, you know, is there, is there, with birds, is there, is there feather damage? Is, are their feet, how do their feet look? How do their wings look? How do their eyes look? How does their head, how does everything look? How does it feel? Do we find anything wrong immediately? Do we see anything that's suspicious that might lead us to decide that we need to do radiographs or x-rays with that animal? Um, and then determine a course of action based on what the findings are. And all of that is recorded in a, in a database um, that is kept. We can go back to see what the initial exam showed. So with the case of Grinnell, we're doing a day-to-day -day weight, uh, which is really important for a lot of animals to make sure that they are eating properly, that they don't necessarily have some kind of problem that's causing them to lose weight. And, uh, and the, so we do a daily log on the animals. And uh, this, in this case, Grinnell is getting uh, medication twice a day, both um, antibiotics and anti-inflammatories and antiparasitics. Uh, so he's on a fair amount of medication. So um, we actually had someone ask um, about the parasites. Uh, do you know much about the parasites that he had? He has uh, capillaria and I'm not an expert on parasites, um, but it gets treated with a specific type of drug. And then in a certain period of time, depending on which uh, parasite it is, we'll recheck, um, in this case, the fecal, uh, to see if the parasites are still present. Um, and then I, the question uh, asked is, um, it, could the rivals have sensed the, that he had a parasite and gone after him uh, because of that? What do you think, Lynn? Um, I don't know. I don't know if I could speak to whether or not the rivals could sense that. I mean, it's pretty common for wild animals to have some amount of parasite load. So I wouldn't be surprised if the rival also had parasites at the same time. <laughs> But on the other hand, a very high parasite load uh, can have, you know, really big effects on the survival of animals. It's especially true for young birds and falcons. A high parasite load can actually make it harder for them to uh, learn to fly in the first place. Yeah, and also, of course, a lot depends on what kind of parasite. I mean, many animals come into us with external parasites, fleas, ticks. Um, all kinds of external um, flying things that get onto birds. Um, and then there's the internal, the stuff that's found in their fecal. Some, sometimes there's parasites found in blood. Uh, so it, it's, it's quite variable. Who's this on the... Uh, I think we have Annie on the nest. That on is... the nest right now, we have, we have Annie. So we're switching to, to the... the screen with Annie on it. Um, but... What I'm, I'd be interested to know is how common is this capillaria parasite? I'm sorry, ask the question again. Uh, how, how common is this capillaria parasite? It's not uncommon. Um, it's not the most common parasite we see, but it's not uncommon. All right, uh, should we answer some more questions? Yeah, I think you had some. Um, yeah, I figure, so this one departs a little bit from the wildlife rehab part, but people are pretty interested in this. I've seen several questions in this vein. Um, so Annie, who's in the nest box right now, and the new guy seem to be cautiously showing some bonding behavior. Uh, does Grinnell have a chance to regain his territory? Um, is there any chance that once Grinnell returns, Annie will help drive off the new guy? That's uh, a really good question, and um, we don't have a, a perfect answer for it. It really depends on the individual. Um, you know, all, all of these birds are, uh, they have their individual personalities and characteristics and how aggressive or defensive they are. And um, we just saw Annie do a little bit of uh, a scrape right there. Yeah, so. <laughs> which already showing some interest in nesting and here i'm going to hide the question because you're getting covered cheryl yeah, yeah that's okay <laughs> <laughs> um, um, 
Yeah, that that was an interesting behavior. This is a little early for that. But, yeah, she. Yeah. We we have seen her do it year round. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, I think it, she's been doing breeding behaviors more with the new guy in the picture. Uh -huh. um, so I think she is kind of showing that she's receptive to his his courtship. Um, it when Grinnell is released. Um, we just don't know if he's going to go back to the territory um, or if he's going to try to go somewhere else. If he goes back to the territory, if he'll try to compete um, and how he'll do. And I don't think we really know how Annie will respond to him being back in the picture as well. Um, she may just let the two males duke it out and, uh, and, and wait to see who the victor is. Um, yeah, it's most likely that Annie's going to stay back from any sort of conflict between the two males. Annie's most interested in maintaining her own territory. And so getting involved in a conflict between two other falcons puts her at risk of getting injured herself. Although she does, because Grinnell has been a mate for a long time and they have been very productive and successful, um, Annie does favor Grinnell potentially a little bit. So I don't know for sure, but my guess is she's not going to get involved. And we should also mention that um, from the reports that we've had and, and, and kind of what we know might have happened, um, Grinnell may have been in a fight with two birds, um, a male and a female. The unknown female is still around the campus, but hasn't been seen aggressively going after the territory or yeah um, the female has been the unknown female has been keeping her distance which yeah. indicates to us that annie uh annie is remaining dominant and this other female may be biding her time for a chance to move in but does not seem to want to make that move and so if grinnell does come back he maybe have a, an entirely different fight ahead of him than he did the first time around. He might be going one-on-one -on -one with the male rather than fighting with both the male and female. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Um, you know, this is it all depends on uh, Grinnell having a recovery that is uh, um, successful um, and, and being able to be released. All right, let's see. All right, so We'd like to hear a little more about the process of Grinnell getting ready to be released. Will he have a chance to fly in an aviary or is that too dangerous for a wild bird? How is he getting prepared before he gets released back into the wild? In, in general, um, with, with birds, we, we do try to get them flight conditioned before they are returned to the wild. So we have different kinds of aviary setups for different species of raptors. Um, in the case of a peregrine, he can certainly, and Grinnell, could certainly uh, get flight conditioning in one of our large, large flight aviaries. But sometimes if the turnaround is quick, it's, it's, we prefer to get them back out there. So it's kind of gonna depend with Grinnell on how long he ends up being in care. If, if it's um, another few days from now, this week, uh, he might not go to a flight aviary. He might just go straight out. Um, they, they get in condition really quickly once they get out there. It doesn't take them much time to, to regain, to regain, their, regain um, their muscle tone. So it kind of depends on how long it ends up being in care. And with some falcons, and this is not the case with Grinnell, but some that come into us with, for example, a wing injury, like broken bone or something, we may not put them in a flight aviary, but we might condition them through falconry techniques. Uh, and that's a, a whole different process. There aren't too many species that we do that with normally, but we do do, do that fairly often with peregrine falcons. And we had another question kind of about the aviary and, and gr caring for Grinnell. Um, but uh, is Grinnell fed live or dead birds by hand? Or um, is, are they put into a cage with him? Or how does, how does that work right now? For Grinnell in particular, he did not eat the first couple days he was in care. 
And he had enough uh, fat deposits on him that we weren't concerned about him not eating for several days. But we watch, again, that's why we watch really closely what's going on with the birds. We weigh them daily. And uh, we were get, just getting ready to start um, hand feeding him. Or in some cases, we end up having to tube feed. That's putting a tube down into their stomach and feed them food directly into their stomach. Uh, it, we didn't have to do that with Grinnell. He decided that he was hungry and he wanted to start eating. And I think, I don't know if, if you saw, if you put Lindsay's last post on that showed Grinnell. With the huge crop. So much, he had a crop, like, I mean, it was one of the biggest crops I've ever seen. So I think he finally decided he was really hungry. So specifically to answer the question, we feed only dead food um, unless we are having to pray test birds that might have eye problems or young birds that have never caught live prey. Then we do live prey um, in a flight cage. Uh, but with Grinnell, um, the food is placed into his hospital cage and he can choose to eat when he wants during the day. So when Grinnell kind of gets close to, to um, being released, how do you decide uh, where he will be released? Well, I'm actually going to leave that up to uh, Cal Falcons and Santa Cruz Predatory Bird Research Group. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th this normally, if I'm going to release a bird, an adult male uh, that has a territory would go right back to his territory. Um, but once I have birds in my care right now, a gray horned owl, for example, that I know has lost her territory. So I can release her in the areas because she'll know where she is but I might not release her exactly where she was found because of the potential for conflict. So that's the, that's the decision that um, people that know more about falcons than in terms of their territoriality than I do. Uh, I've rehabbed falcons. Um, we released an adult female that had lost her territory. We released her oh, about 20 miles away from where she was found. And she made her way back to the territory and fought with the, um, the, the female that had taken over her territory. So she went back on her own. We didn't release her back into her territory because we knew that there was a high potential for a problem. In this case, it's a little iffier because these two, these two the interloper and, and uh, Annie have not completely bonded. So I'm gonna leave it up to people who know, know what, better than me as to where, the, where Grinnell gets released. Yeah, our preliminary talks between the Cal Falcons group is we're throwing around the idea of releasing Grinnell um, up uh, by the Lawrence Hall of Sciences, which is up the hill in the Berkeley Hills. Um, and you can see the Campanile from outside the Lawrence Hall of Sciences, but it is kind of in the distance. So the thought would be Grinnell can see his territory and can assess whether he does want to engage or whether he's going to decide that this is no longer his territory and it will work better for him to find a new place to go to. But I don't think we've settled on that no, at no, all. And so, either. yeah, the Santa Cruz predatory bird research people will probably be the ones to give us the, the final word on that. Yeah. And I don't know that there is any right answer to all this anyway. It's it's a best guess and a best guess scenario. Um, and you, we just do what we can do and hope that things will work out because we just don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah, and if, if Grinnell wants to go back to his territory, he's going to go back to his territory no matter where we release him. Uh, yes. Birds have an unbelievable navigation ability uh, to return to um, places that they know. Um, so. You know, we can't like be like, well, he's lost, but we want him to stick or, or still live. So we're going to take, take him to a new place and he'll be happy there. Take him to the farm upstate or something. There um, were a lot of uh, efforts made to relocate birds that were creating hazards at airports, uh, raptors, and they reloc trapped and relocated number, lots of raptors and huge numbers of them return to the airport, even though they dropped them off 100 miles away. So they they definitely have, like you said, an amazing sense of uh, navigation and know what their home turf is and typically will want to go back to their home turf. 
Yeah, so here's a question I'm putting up, but I don't actually know the answer <laughs> to. I'm going to guess uh, maybe no one exactly knows the answer to, but with Grinnell's absence, how long would Annie or any Falcon wait for their usual mate to come back? And it's really hard to say. I mean, what we know now is that, you know, Annie is acting relatively receptive to this new male. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, a, about a week after Grinnell disappeared in her in her mm -hmm. mind. Um, I, I don't think, uh, you know, wild animals tend to, to dilly dally and wait around. If, if there's a promising new suitor for Annie, um, she might you know, entertain that notion, even um, if she doesn't know where Grinnell is um, and, and have kind of an idea of waiting for him. Yeah. I mean, it should be noted that there is, um, I think even in the Bay Area, there are instances where there's peregrine falcons where one member of the pair does not migrate and will remain in the Bay Area year round. And another member of the pair does migrate to a wintering site and um, when that dynamic exists, I know that occasionally if an outsider does come in sometime during the winter and the territory holder returns, it will be a matter of conflict between the outsider and the territory holder to determine who ultimately gets that territory. So yeah, that's that. true with many species of raptors that they mate for what we say, what they say life, uh, but life has a lot of curves that it throws us, right? And so if one mate goes missing, and I think it's usually gonna be close to breeding season when those final decisions are made. Um, if, if a mate has gone missing or um, sometimes, like you said, the, the interlopers come in and they're the more dominant or the stronger and the mated pair that mated for life is no longer a pair. All right, we have another question for you about Grinnell. So part of Grinnell's beak is broken. Do we have a procedure to put the beak back on or does it grow back on its own? In this case, it grows back on its own. It, it, it will take a little bit of time, but it will grow back. So the, the part of the beak that was broken was the very tip and that's made out of keratin. So same as your fingernails and hair. Um, so it's a it's not bone that was broken. Um, it's um, a part that will grow back naturally. Uh, it'll take some time. Yeah. Well, and the part that's broken in captivity sometimes will actually the tip of the bill will become overgrown and uh, keepers or whatever will have to actively kind of file that area. So, um, yeah, we know that 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 will grow. So in, in, in rehab, if we have long-term birds, and like you said, in education programs or zoos where they have birds, they do typically have to trim both the beak and the talons uh, because they can get overgrown. All right. Uh, so this is a question about Lindsay Wildlife. Uh, can the public come and visit Grinnell during his rehab, or is he off display? Yeah, we, uh, we are not allowed to display by federal and state law um, any of our wildlife hospital animals. But if you visit uh, Lindsay, there is a, a viewing area where they do programs and they will bring in a patient and talk to the viewing public through a one-way glass. Uh, I can't, I have no idea if Grinnell will ever be part of that, but you can see hospital patients uh, undergoing treatment um, on a scheduled basis at Lindsay. All right, so around when will Grinnell be released? Hmm. Again, that's, uh, it's, 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 this is a, a, a guess. Um, we are, he, he had a, a wound on his wing that needed sutures and those uh, are, that is being monitored daily. Uh, when I looked um, at his record yesterday, there was a little bit of discharge coming out of that wound still. So it's not healed all the way. Uh, suture, sutures can come out in uh, as soon as two weeks. So it's going to depend on how that wing heals and how the parasite load is. He will be rechecked um, early next week. 
for his parasite load, and then we'll have a better idea of where we're going uh, because that wound and the parasite load and any else, any other things that crop up might might cause problems. For example, um, a lot of times in captivity, a birds develop feet problems, problems with the bottom of their feet. In, in rehabilitation, we take great care to make sure that they have the right substrates, um, that, that their feet are well taken care of. But sometimes things come up. Um, they sometimes talon themselves. So we have to watch for everything like that on a daily basis. So it's hard to say, I think, to be safe, no longer than a month, presumably, hopefully, after he came in, but as short as two weeks. So that's all I can all I can throw out there as a guess. And um, we should mention, um, you know, Lindsay Wildlife has been putting in just a tremendous amount of work on not only Grinnell, but uh, rehabbing lots of other um, wild animals. And they they are a, a nonprofit um, that is heavily funded by donations. So I'm going to put in the comments a link to their donation page. I'm sure they would love uh, some support from us uh, as they care for Grinnell and all the other um, birds and animals in, in the area. Thank you, Sean. We appreciate that a lot because yeah, they're just, just buying the quail for a falcon is an expensive um, proposition. And this year already we have received, uh, as of yesterday when I looked, 324 birds of prey. And wow. that's eagles, hawks, falcons, osprey, um, everything. Uh, and the, the number one species that came into our hospital this year uh, was red-tailed hawks followed by cooper's hawks. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different species. And in, in the, in the uh, raptor group, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, seventeen 17 species that came in this year. Wow. Wow. That's a that's like every raptor in California practically. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I mean, except for uh, we didn't get any goshawks, um, which are common to the mountainous areas, and we didn't get any um, uh, one of the other falcons. But yeah, pretty much most probably, of the species. Probably no California condors either. <laughs> yeah. No, thank goodness. Although I did. Did you all see that cool article that there was a condor that flew over near Mount Diablo? Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's very cool. So that's first spotting of a condor in Contra Costa County in who knows how many years. Wow. That's, that's amazing yeah. to know that they're they're starting to move back into their historical territory. Yeah. But on the topic of the kinds of species Lindsay takes in, what does someone do if they find an injured raptor, um, you know, in the Bay Area, but just in general, what what should you do if you find an injured raptor or just injured animal in general? Uh, I think there's, there's a, yeah, in injured animals, anything to do with the rabies vector species, which could be bats or skunks, um, any mammal, really, you have to be super careful not to have any uh, direct contact with that animal uh, that could transmit rabies. So using a tool like a, a broom or something to kind of push it into a box and secure it without having any contact. Because if a rabies vector species comes into our wildlife hospital, that's had contact and possible, uh, you know, direct contact with humans or pets, it has to be tested for rabies. And that means we have to euthanize the animal to have it tested. Um, then if there are other circumstances, like if you find an animal in barbed wire, uh, but, don't try to take the animal off the wire. Cut the wire and bring the whole thing into us because we unfortunately have gotten to be quite expert at trying to remove barbed wire without causing further damage. Um, anything, just you just have to be careful. If there's a bird on the ground, you can use, if it's a small bird, uh, you can use a small cloth. If it's a raptor, you can use a big towel and put it over the animal gently pull in its wings and get it in a box and keep it in a warm, dark and quiet place it can, until it can go into a, the nearest wildlife center because there are several around the Bay Area. Uh, so you mentioned um, barbed wire. That's a bit of a surprise to me as a threat to um, birds. Are there any, what are the kind of 
big threats that you guys see? Why, why are birds coming into Lindsay Wildlife? Well, just the a huge amount of reasons. And again, depending on the species. I mean, with the raptors, they're not so likely to be cat caught, cat or dog caught. But um, young birds that are just learning how to fly that are on the ground are very susceptible to cat and dog attacks. And that's probably one of the number one reasons that animals are brought into our hospital. But in terms of raptors, windows are a big problem, barbed wire, gunshot victims, uh, cars, vehicles in general. And uh, what am I missing? Mm, I think that's, oh, and uh, rodenticide, rodent poisoning. Secondary poisoning from uh, people who are using rat poison. Uh, so we strongly recommend not using rat poison because there are a lot of unintended victims of rat poison that go to eat a dying rat or mouse, including our pets. All right. And then in that same vein, this is something I just kind of like to bring up because I think this happens to a lot of people. Uh, and this season won't be around for a little bit, but what do you, what do, you do if you find a baby bird? Well, actually, it's mating season right now for great horned owls and hummingbirds will be coming in in February. So it's true. Really You're right. <laughs> Baby birds, again, it depends on the circumstances. It, if they're feathered and they're looking perky and hopping around, it's probably just fine to leave them as long as you keep, you know, domestic cats away. There is a time in almost every bird's life that it ends up on the ground when it can't quite figure out how to fly properly. And we've gotten a number of, of peregrines in that this has happened to. When they fledge, they go, oh, oh, what do I do now? And they end up on the ground. And somebody brings them in, and if they're fine and not, you know, not harmed in any way, we turn around and get them out as soon as possible. So, But if the bird it doesn't have feathers or if it looks not healthy if it's all fluffed up and you know looking kind of like not not well then please bring it into your near, nearest wildlife hospital and uh, they can assess whether it can go back to the nest or not yeah i just as a small anecdote of my own i volunteered for some time at minnesota's um, raptor rehab mm -hmm. facility and we had this one um, young great horned owl who came from a nest that was on a very well-traveled um, hiking path around an urban lake. <laughs> and great horned owls specifically have a pretty long period where they're called branchers. And it's where the perfectly healthy young, before they really know how to fly, just climb around in the trees and will sometimes climb around on the ground. And people found that individual brancher owl on the ground several times, perfectly healthy, but it came into the raptor rehab place, I think three separate times. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. And an interesting thing about great horned owls is they have a very different approach to uh, raising their fledglings or their branchers. Um, they basically will follow the babies wherever the babies go. So when that kind of circumstance happens where uh, the babies are coming into a, a well-traveled place with a lot of humans around, I'll move it. I'll move it uh, a ways away. And parents will always go to it because they are used to following their baby's calls as opposed to other birds of prey that are used to having the babies follow them for their food. Uh, so great horned owls, it actually makes it a little easier to return the young uh, to bad locations because of that. So here's a kind of a interesting philosophical question that we have. Uh, previous Q&As, we've mentioned that we would not interfere in the falcon's health unless the damage was human caused. So for example, if a chick was in the nest and was sick or not getting fed, our policy is to is not to interfere um, in, in that instance. Um, but this is a situation where the injury was caused by um, another falcon, um, and it's not a human induced problem. And we um, are obviously interfering in nature a little bit. Um, so is this kind of a change in how we we think about things? Um, and 
I don't know if I have a great answer for it. Do you? So I, I do have an answer for this and we'll see Cheryl, if you feel the same way. So when we say we're not interfering uh, with the natural process, we're especially talking about these young birds that are being raised by Annie and Grinnell. Um, the survival rate for a young raptor is not very high. And the thing is, if what's happening is that the young bird is um you know still in the nest and the adults are not able to uh raise it they're not able to feed it there's something going on if we went and we took in that bird um it would essentially become sort of domestic it would not have been able to survive sort of in general and it would be essentially raised in captivity at that point whereas grinnell has gotten injured and will be able to be treated um and released successfully how, how does that parse with where you're at cheryl well, let me just add to that a little bit um technically it is completely illegal to remove a bird from its nest um without having a federal uh, fish and wildlife permission um, the banders that go into the nests have permission to disturb the nests, uh, but it's for those specific purposes for the purpose of research. So uh, interfering in a nest, um, like you said, is, is different. Um, there's still a lot of controversy as to whether wildlife rehabilitation is even something that should be done. Um, because in some cases we are, in this case, Grinnell might have been able to survive on his own, but might not have. Um, so we are interfering with nature in that way. And many, and many of our hospital patients are from human caused injuries, but we do see regular fights. We got two red tails this past year that were on the ground with their talons still locked. Um, so that's not human caused, but where do you draw the line in rehab? Um, you know, that's a hard call. Somebody finds an injured bird. We can't determine when it's brought through the door, if it's human caused or caused by nature, if you will, um, immediately. You know, our guess when Grinnell came in, based on the circumstances, was that that was uh, caused by a fight. And it seems like that's been proven out now. But we don't know. So how do you treat human caused injuries versus nature caused injuries? It's, yeah, it's a really tough kind of philosophical and ethical discussion that people have a lot of thoughts on. And um, yeah, it's just one that we need to all kind of discuss as, as the community about what we want to do with the injured animal. Yeah. So here's, here's a Grinnell question. Um, will Annie recognize Grinnell? If he comes back, will Annie give him any preference because he was a previous mate? And um, question one, Annie will definitely recognize Grinnell. Um, it, you know, individual falcons are able to recognize their mates uh, very effectively. And I mean, often from a very long distance, just by one call. Um, will Annie give him any preference? Um, as I kind of speculated before, it's likely that if Grinnell does return to the territory and confronts this um, new interloper, Annie's going to stay out of it. Annie's interests are being able to breed for another season and raise more healthy young, which if she gets caught up in a uh, fight, she could get injured and that might not happen. On the other hand, there is, it is her prerogative if there's, you know, a male that's trying to move onto the territory that she does not perceive will be able to properly care for young. There is some chance that Annie would make some move in favor of Grinnell, but it's really hard to say. Most likely she's going to stay out of it. And uh, very briefly, uh, someone asked if this was this uh, a video is going to be archived. And yes, it will be archived on the YouTube channel, so you'll be able to play it back um, at a later at a later date. 
All right. Question is, will Grinnell be able to hunt before his beak has grown in? And the answer on that is hunting itself, that's an activity that for the raptors it involves the feet. Uh, they're catching their prey with their feet. It's the talons that they use to dispatch their prey. Um, the beak, so we'll still work for its basic function of, you know, pulling apart prey and eating it. It will be a little less effective at, um, oftentimes the beak is what's used for the kind of, uh, final separating vertebrae. That's how sometimes falcons will, uh, finish killing their prey, but usually, uh, the work is done with the talons. So Grinnell should be fine, even with the damage to the beak until it grows back. All right, so um, Grinnell was, uh, the, the place Grinnell was found is about a mile and a half-ish from the Campanile. Um, and so the question is, is that a part of their territory or was he trying to escape? Uh, Falcon territories are a bit blobby um, and we don't have a great map of uh, where the boundaries are between each territory. Um, it's relatively likely that that part of Berkeley is still within the territory, given what where we know the other peregrine falcons are in the Bay Area. But it's hard to say. I mean, it's a little far away, but it's for a falcon not very far from, from where he was found to the Campanile. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, wouldn't be surprised if that was still kind of considered a part of their territory. Well, and it's also interesting that the question is asking if Grinnell had fled. It's also possible that Grinnell was chasing the interloper away. Mm -hmm. um, so that that might have taken him a little bit further afield than he would normally go as well. Very good point. All right, let me. Um, so this, this is a question that's going to be pure speculation. Um, mm -hmm. if he hadn't been rescued, what would have Grinnell's chances of survival really have been? Yeah, that, like you said, that's pure speculation. He did have a pretty nasty leg injury. Um, it's amazing to me what wild animals can do in terms of their own healing processes. I mean, I used to live in a place where I had three legged deer that were surviving. So they had some sort of injury that caused them to lose part of their leg and they were still able to do what they needed to do. There's a falcon, another falcon in the Bay Area that had a broken, broken leg and it, it healed imperfectly, um, but he's still around doing okay. There was one up on Mount Diablo that had another injury that he's, I don't remember if that was female or male, um, that, that was obvious when you saw the bird that there was an old injury. So it's hard to say if the in, if the wound in the leg didn't get infected, it could have been fine. Um, it's it's hard to say. It could have been fine, or it could have led to his. If he couldn't get up and hunt since he was already grounded, how long could he stay on the ground without being um, predated on? Uh, that's another question. When they're grounded, they can they can get attacked by a lot of other animals. Uh, so if they can get off the ground, then how are they going to be able to hunt? If they can hunt um, and they can fly, then you'd think the chances would be pretty good. Yeah. I mean, the two of us, we were watching uh, a peregrine falcon nest in the Bay Area where maybe this is the one you're thinking of, but the, the male disappeared for a month and then suddenly showed back up with a very damaged foot, but then was back on territory and they raised chicks again. Yeah. And in the Minnesota area, I was involved in monitoring a nest where the male was this tiny little male falcon and he was missing several of his toes on one foot and in theory, you know, those feet are what they need to hunt and survive, but that falcon was not only successfully raising uh, a brood of four chicks, but also had um, cached prey just 
stack deep all over the place. So even with those injuries, this male was able to do well. And so it's hard to speculate if, you know, Grinnell would have been eaten by a cat in, you know, 10 minutes or if Grinnell would have been able to sit on the ground, get strength back, get back into the air eventually. So hard to say. And I guess this loops back to the like, human interference is it a human caused injury and the injury that he's being treated for right now was definitely naturally caused but would what finally killed him have been a human caused (laughs) injury hello here's our cat um our indoor cat who remains indoors for the safety of our local birds i'll just put that little fact out there (laughs) And I live in an area that has uh, got a really heavy load of coyotes. So people around here keep their cats in for their cat safety. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here's a question specific to Grinnell. How old is Grinnell? Um, so we know how old Grinnell is thanks to uh, bird banding records. Uh, most uh, birds that we uh, see out in the wild do not have a bird band. So it's a little bit more speculation. Um, But we know that Grinnell was banded in 2013 um, as a juvenile. And so he is eight years old. Um, And for Annie, we know that she's at least seven because she had full adult plumage, um, which takes two years to get um, in 2016 when we first saw her. Um, So that's kind of what we know about Annie's age. Uh, And this new falcon, we know he's at least two um, because he's got full adult plumage as well. Yeah, so falcons, as, you know, the followers of Cal Falcons know, the first year of their life, when they first get out of the nest, they have the uh, brownish feathering with the vertical streaking rather than the gray feathering and the horizontal barring. And... um, Yeah, a falcon will, by the second summer of their, yeah, by the second year of their life, will have started to grow in those adult feathers. So that's why we know that this new bird is at least two, um, but anywhere between two and who knows, yeah. (laughs) Probably not 20, but. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's likely this is a younger bird because this bird presumably does not have an established territory, but we also don't know. Maybe this bird got kicked off of its territory and is now looking for its new territory for all we know. Um, And here's another, uh, from watching past years, it seems like Grinnell is a wonderful falcon father. Are his parenting abilities typical of male peregrines? Uh, I think this is a great question because there's a tremendous amount of variation in um, how much parental care is given by the male falcons for peregrines. Um, most of the time, uh, the female does the majority of the incubating of the eggs and the male does the majority of the hunting. Um, but there's variation around that. There's been some nests where the male does the majority of the incubation and the female does the majority of the hunting. Um, Grinnell has been a very good provider Um, for the chicks uh, that he has raised. Um, I have been very impressed uh, by his abilities. Yeah, and uh, as far as on average goes, Grinnell does seem to spend more time incubating than the average male peregrine falcon would, and he spends... People often during the season are like, we haven't seen Grinnell on camera. Is he okay? Well, actually, Grinnell's on camera maybe a lot more than we'd even expect because a lot of falcon fathers incubate a little bit but for most of the season are just bringing food and not necessarily spending a whole lot of time directly at the nest site so grinnell's a pretty involved father as far as peregrine falcons go all right let's see let's look for some new questions yeah Um, let's see. A lot of comments about the cat. <laughs> yeah, there. you know, the internet loves cats. Um, so Annie is unbanded. Um, could Annie be banded now? Uh, 
So something happens, but they know it happened. Um, so Grinnell already is banded. And so we, you know, are able to follow him if he does move to a new territory and he gets found again. Um, Annie is the one who is unbanded. Now, if hypothetically Annie ended up in rehab, she would get banded. Am I correct? Most likely. We we do we don't have a banding permit, but with the peregrines, I would reach out to Santa Cruz Predatory Bird Research. I have a female uh, first year bird in my care now, and uh, as soon as she's ready to release, they will band her for me. Yeah, um, but unless Annie came to some sort of circumstance like that, while she is a free flying adult bird, we are unable to band her because, well, I mean. First and foremost, we could not possibly catch her as a free-flying adult peregrine falcon on her territory like she is. So um, Annie will probably remain unbanded her whole life. This new male that's come in is also unbanded, so we don't get the backstory on, on him, unfortunately. Um, let's see. So someone was curious about... Um, so sometimes it seems like Annie recently, she's been doing a little bit of the head bow display in the nest box, but she's been doing it alone. And the unknown male is maybe 10 to 20 feet away. Do the bow at distance like that? What is she doing with that behavior? And she's definitely kind of soliciting pairing behavior from that male. Um, I'm showing that she is, she would be receptive to it. Um, <laughs> the, the cat just thought that the falcon was real for a second there. Uh, <laughs> um, the uh, so um, she's definitely communicating with that male. Um, the male still seems pretty skittish, which makes a lot of sense because um, female peregrine falcons are a substantially larger uh, bird than the males are, so they are a danger. Um, you know, and he sees Annie as a danger, um, so he's not quite comfortable around her yet. Yeah, and then we have someone just, you know, kind of putting out, and this is a feeling I have myself, so, you know, the conflict between Grinnell and a new guy is sad, but it's also great the peregrines have recovered from, you know, pretty close to total extirpation from the entire U.S. so well that there's enough peregrines to have this conflict, that there actually is active competition at territories, um, which wouldn't have been happening 30 years ago at all because there were barely enough falcons to take up any territory. Well, and, and I think we should ask Cheryl uh, on, on this vein, like in your time doing wildlife rehab, you've seen the peregrine falcon kind of come back. And so, you know, what have you guys learned and ha have you had to adapt your skill set to, to meet the kind of demands of having more peregrines show up at, at Lindsay Wildlife. Well, and actually that's the reason I got my falconry license because we were getting at one point, I think it was, I don't remember what year it was, but at one point we had like five or six peregrines in our wildlife hospital in one year, which I mean, it used to be we'd get a peregrine and it was like, oh, we got a peregrine, we got a peregrine. And now it's like, oh, we've got another peregrine. <laughs> because we do unfortunately get them in and, um, that's why I got my falconry license because peregrines are unique in the way that we need to manage them, as I said earlier. Uh, and yeah, so that definitely changed my behavior. It changed the behavior of us, of the hospital in terms of how we work with other falconers um, and what we do to try to do the best we can do to rehabilitate falcons. Uh, yeah. Peregrines, I should say, because I also work with merlins and kestrels. Yeah, so that kind of opens up. I'm sort of curious about uh, how do you end up with a falconer's license? You know, how, how, you know, how does that process work and how does falconry, you know, play into the raptor rehab and raptor recovery stuff? Well, falconry, to get a falconry license is, is quite a process. You have to get a sponsor of an experienced um, master falconer and uh, then you have to work with that person for one to two years. 
uh, training in technique of falconry and you have to take exams and um, pay fees and, <laughs> and pay annual fees, you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, what, what I was most interested in was the technique because with peregrines, the youngsters or, or those that come in with, you know, like I said, broken wings, we can't gauge their flight. We can't gauge their hunting ability in any kind of flight cage. Given the biggest flight cage we could build, I don't think we could gauge it. So falconry techniques are used for us to really be able to assess if that bird is releasable or not. Um, I've had several that have been released and I've had several that couldn't cut it in, in the way they were flying. Uh, so this has given us a, another tool in our ability to assess releasability on, on, on the birds of prey. Um, so we have a, a question on who the new, new guy is. Um, is it possible the new guy could actually be one of Annie's former chicks? Would that be problematic? Um, and we actually know that it is not one of Annie's former chicks um, because it is uh, unbanded. And all of Annie and Grinnell's offspring are banded. Um, there's maybe a slight potential. It could be one of their grandchildren from Alcatraz um, where they haven't been able to band, band the chicks at Alcatraz that are their grand chicks. Um, but... Um, well, their grand chicks aren't old enough. Oh, you're right. To you're right. The grand, the grand chicks aren't old adult enough. Adult plumage yet, anyways. So, um, so <laughs> no, we 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 know it is not one of their kind of immediate descendants, um, unless it's a, an unknown grand chick from an unknown location, uh, which is not super likely. Uh, as far as inbreeding goes, um, that is definitely a major concern in um, released populations of animals. Um, you know, when, when populations get as low as they did with peregrine falcons or with, for example, the California condor, uh, that is a huge concern. Um, and there's a lot of effort that goes into breeding programs to make sure that inbreeding does not affect populations. Um, luckily with peregrines, there was a, a lot of um, uh, falconry stock available for the breeding program. So um, there wasn't as much a concern with the uh, birds being released into the wild initially that they would interbreed and have problems. Um, so we think that in the wild right now that there's pretty good um, gene variation and genetic variation. Um, and so it's not really a big worry um, that we're gonna end up with in, inbred birds. Yeah, so someone just asked, uh... Are there any confirmed grand chicks of Annie and Grinnell? That would be amazing. And there are. Um, Annie's, Annie and Grinnell's uh, daughter, Larry Laurentium, nests on Alcatraz and they've had a successful, a successful nest and have raised- uh, two, two years in a row. Yeah, so. Um, unfortunately, so the nest at Alcatraz is, is the first year they couldn't access it due to COVID, um, COVID regulations. Uh, and the second year they couldn't access it because um, it's right in the middle of a breeding uh, cormorant colony. So um, you can't actually get to the nest without disturbing all the cormorants. <laughs> um, so it, I don't know if they're ever going to be able to ban Yeah, they might nest. never be able to ban the young at that nest. So we'll we'll not be able to know what happens to the grand chicks from there necessarily. All right. So here, here's a question. Cause we were talking about how Grinnell, we're probably going to release him somewhere near, but not directly at his territory. But if an unbanded peregrine falcon is injured, that means that the people treating the bird don't know where the bird came from necessarily. Um, how would you know where to release the bird? If you don't really know where it came from, can they find their way back to their territory? Well, you guys can help answer on this one, but I think it's true with almost any um, any bird of prey. The babies all have to go find their own territories eventually. So picking a release site for a young bird is a lot easier. Uh, I have one now, like I said, that's a first year bird that came from a lake in uh, Fremont, I think. We have no idea where that bird's from. 
um, and why, you know, if it was near there, but it was a first year bird, so it's most likely that was near the nest. But um, for, for adult birds, uh, we try to get them back close to where they came from because that is their territory, unless they're migratory birds. That's a whole nother story because there's some birds that don't nest here at all and they're fully migratory. So we just need to make sure we get them somewhere on the migratory path. Um, and if they're flocking birds, we need to get them with another, um, a, a flock of their own kind that are migrating. So what, what would you do if you had a bird that came into the rehab clinic, you know, maybe late fall during migration and by the time it's been um, returned to good health, it's winter <laughs> and it's not a bird that lives here during the winter, what, what do you do? Yeah, it, 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 again, it's going to be somewhat species specific, uh, but sometimes birds have to be held for a longer period of time when they're finished with rehab just because of migration. Uh, you can't just throw a migrant out there that should be in Argentina when in March when it's now March. You can't do that. So um, it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but most of the birds that we get are, are not necessarily migrate. Some do migrate. Um, I'll use an example of Swainson's hawks. Most of the Swainson's hawks that come into California are migrants um, and they will migrate in and out, uh, come in at the winter and they leave um, and go to their breeding grounds. But there are some Swainson's that are here year round now. Um, so it would really depend on the age of the bird and the circumstances. But with the Swainsons, we'd want to get them out before the end of migration if we could, if we got the youngsters in during the breeding season. All right. Was that, was that, was that clear at all? No, yeah, I think yeah, that was. Yeah, I, I at least understood it. Uh, people can chime in if they need more clarification. But, uh, and I guess we're actually getting kind of, We've hit the four o'clock mark. Uh, me and Sean, we're willing to hang out for a little longer. But not too much longer. <laughs> uh, but yeah, not too much longer. Our kids in, at preschool right now, and we'll need to be picked up in a few minutes. Uh, Cheryl, can you take a couple, right. maybe a couple minutes? Yeah, fine. All right. Um, so we have the question, will other species ever try and compete for the coveted spot above Cal? Uh, this is a really good question because uh, with with raptors, um, every every bird has different needs at, at, at a nest site. Um, you know, you, you don't see uh, a kestrel nesting in like a giant eagle nest. Um, so what we know about the birds in the area is there aren't really any that would be looking for the exact same type of nest location as a peregrine falcon. So um, probably not. Um, at least I, not that I can think of. No, I don't think there's any um, bird native to California that would be interested in competing with Annie and Grinnell for that territory other than other peregrine falcons. What you do see, though, in some species is competition for stick nests. Um, oh, yeah. Where, you know, if, <laughs> if you'll see a, a bird like a, an osprey might build a big, nice stick nest and you'll see a red tail come try to steal it. Um, or eagles might try to build a big nest or, or steal someone else's nest and make it bigger. So um, depending on the species, there can be a lot of competition. Another one is nest cavities. Uh, there can be a lot of competition for a really good nest, nest hole in a tree. Um, but luckily for peregrines, they just don't have much that wants the kind of bare, bare ground on top of a cliff that they're looking for. And in case of great horned owls, they don't build nests. They take over nests of any other bird they can find. So they'll take over crow's nest, raven's nest, red tail's nest. A couple years ago, there was a red tail that built a nest, had a family, they fledged, and then the next winter, uh, about December, January, the adult, the great horns came in, they had their babies. The red tails were still in the territory. As soon as the great horn babies left the nest, the red tails came in and took the nest back over for their babies. So, so. I've seen a, a couple people um, ask this question, just we'll, we'll catch everyone up to speed. Um, Grinnell was um, attacked likely by another peregrine falcon, likely by the male the unknown male that is currently trying to court Annie um, and hurt enough where he was taken to uh, the Lindsay Wildlife uh, 
Wildlife Hospital. Um, and so currently on um, the Campanile, Annie is still maintaining the territory. And there's a new male who is um, uh, kind of trying to uh, start courtship behavior with her. And so we're kind of waiting to see what happens. And Grinnell will be released in maybe a, a week to three weeks is kind of the timeline we've, we're have we looking at now. Depends on when he's healthy. Um, and we'll kind of see uh, if he kind of comes back. And uh, I think this question's maybe a good note to en end on, actually. Um, how can someone help with Grinnell's medical care? And the answer is that you can donate to the Lindsay Wildlife Experience and um, help, you know, not only in supporting care for Grinnell, but in care for a lot of the other animals that come in. And it's also worth mentioning, because we haven't touched on this, Lindsay Wildlife Experience, um, half of their facilities are the wildlife rehab, but they also have uh, resident educational birds that they have in the area. So people are able to come and see the education birds they have there. They do educational programs. They have birds on display. I don't know what the, you know, changes in how the education stuff is going on, you know, in kind of times of COVID, but I know at least the outdoor displays were open when we came by, so. The in um, inside is, is open again. Uh, proof of vaccination is required and there's still social distancing and mask required, but they are open. Awesome. Well, it's a wonderful place to visit if you ever have time. It's really cool. Um, to see the animals, see the facilities, um, and yeah. Um, yeah, our son uh, had an absolutely amazing time when he got to visit Lindsay Wildlife Experience, so. At what age? Uh, he just turned three. Oh, good. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so it's yeah, a little bit progress from that, but yeah. Two and a half year old, he's getting into getting into animals at this age, so. That's great. Thanks so much to Lindsay Wildlife for what they do. And uh, I guess on that note, maybe we'll, we'll sign, sign off. Up. And just a huge thank you to Cheryl for uh, joining us today and, and answering our questions. Uh, feel free to drop us a line on social media if you have other questions. We try to answer as many as we can. Um, and keep an eye on the cameras and hope we'll keep you all up to date on what's going on with Grinnell and when he might be back in the air. Thank right. you guys for having me. Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you.